Welcome to another episode of the Pete Cast. Today we'll be interviewing Lone Name Kato Casey, who is the executive director of the Hmong American Friendship Association, and he is an avid leader in the Hmong community. Do not miss out on his coping out story, which is, I believe, the best one yet. And if the last name sounds familiar, yes, he's my dad. This is the Pete Cast. Presented by Strive365, where we strive to eliminate childhood trauma while equipping youth to become resilient and better our community. We discuss social and emotional issues affecting today's time while bringing you experienced leaders to discuss diverse topics in a fun and informative way. Strive365 coming to you all the way live. Strive 365 coming to you all the way live. Everybody, welcome to another episode of the PeteCast. Uh, your co-host here, Hassan Rahim, here with my amazing co-host, JP. Hassan, thanks for the introduction. Today we have a special guest. Guess who it is? It's my dad. Man, uh, we, cool. have, cool. <laughs> we have Low Name Kato Casey, Executive Director of the Hmong American Friendship Association, an avid leader in the Hmong community and also a great supporter for Strive365 as they are they were a sponsor for uh, both our virtual trivia nights. So let's welcome Lo Nang. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I hear a lot of good stuff about you guys and I'm really happy to be here. Cool. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the organization you work for? Oh, sure, sure. My, again, my name is Lo Nang Kita Casey. I'm the director for the Hmong American Friendship Association. And I've been with the Hmong American Friendship since 1996. Wow. Uh, it's a very long time. Uh, we have about 17 different programs. Youth, elderly, housing, jobs, interpretations, and opioid overdose prevention, um, domestic violence prevention. And uh, right now we are also doing COVID-19 video to educate our community. So quite a bit of programs. We served about 12,000 families each year. Wow. Uh, within this year, COVID-19, throughout the country, we serve about 28, 30,000 people uh, for 2020. So it's quite a bit of a, a service that we provide. Now, I've, uh, so I was blessed to get the vaccine because of you. Um, and I remember coming there and I saw the line for the food pantry. And I said, man, that's the line for the vaccine. But it was actually for the pantry. So uh, it's just amazing the things you guys are doing, multiple things. And J JP, you said avid leader for just the Hmong community. No, he's an avid leader for the whole community, yeah. um, making a big difference to everyone. So really appreciate you and what you're doing for this community and everyone around. So yeah. thank you. So you're serving since 1996. Why are you so passionate on serving like the inner city of Milwaukee? You know, uh, I grew up uh, in Laos and migrates to, we came to America in uh, 1980. And we face a lot of hardship, meaning that there's a lot of resources out there, but we cannot get to those resources due to culture or maybe failure. Uh, and going through childhood, I didn't know how to read and write until I was in high school. Wow. Uh, and it's uh, it's really hard. And, I, and just facing all those difficulty, I understand that minority community do face those challenges. So uh, when I grew up, in, had an education, come back and invest my uh, uh, invest my talent into my community. I want to make sure that we connect language wise, culture wise, and get the community to the resources that can help them out. I see uh, an extension of you and him as well. Um, how much he does for the community as well. Uh, I mean, when the vaccine came out, you were immediately telling everybody, "Get it, get it, get it." How he works with the kids. Um, how involved you are with the Hmong community as well. Uh, he got me to play in a basketball league with the Hmong, so that was fun too. And it's just great to see uh, the community growing. Um, I didn't know how big the Hmong community was till I got here. And then um, there was another cool thing that um, you do as well is the uh, Hmong New Year. Yeah, so I got I got to come to that as well. Uh, really fun. Oh, good. So. Yeah, 2020, because COVID-19 yeah. CDC uh, strict guideline, uh, we postponed the Milwaukee Hmong New mm -hmm. Year. Originally, it's on the second week of December. Uh, but this year, we are trying for it. Mm -hmm. Hopefully by then, uh, many of the restrictions will be lifted so yeah. that we can have a celebration in our community year. That was awesome, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you guys definitely check that out. If you get the Hopefully, we'll all get the opportunity December 2nd, um, that week, hopefully. Um, and JP will definitely keep everybody posted. Oh, yeah. Um, 
So we're going to go into a part of our uh, PCAST that we call facelifts. Um, so this is supposed to really lift up someone's face and make them smile. Um, so a time, uh, when is there a time where you've either fostered resilience, acted with empathy, cultivated change, uh, established trust, or served the youth? Um, any situation where you feel you use one of those? Sure, you know, established trust. Uh, Milwaukee is such a segregated city by different ethnic groups, mm -hmm. and also within the Hmong community too. Uh, we have 18 plants, so they're pretty diverse and pretty isolated. Um, for me to come to Milwaukee in 1996, I had to work like 10 years hard to get the trust of the community. Mm -hmm. Where before that, I worked as a uh, with community with Minnesota Acorn. It's a grassroots organization that you take people to protest. And within three months, I gained the trust of the people in Minnesota. But for some weird reason, we walk a year. It's really different. Mm -hmm. Ten years, but once you gain that trust, it's really um, it's been re rewarding. Yeah. So that if you want to have a if you want to have a protest or a turnout, you can just call your leader's friend, and they will call their. Um, their clan members, and you know, you can turn out five, six hundred, a thousand people to a protest, and that's the kind of tr uh, trust level. So mm -hmm. that way, when we do the COVID nineteen test uh, video and also the, the walking clinic, uh, you know, it doesn't really take much promotion, mm -hmm. uh, but it just uh, word of mouth to the clan leaders. Hey, uh, you know, we need to reach out to your clan members. How do we get this thing done? And usually, when they say I'm going to get it done, mm -hmm. you can always count on hundred percent. Yeah, that's awesome. And yeah, establishing trust, definitely not easy. I mean, especially for what you're trying to do. Um, it takes a lot for someone to say, you know what? Yeah, I, I do want you to help me. So a lot of time they haven't gotten help. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, 10 years is a long time. But like you said, it's so rewarding mm -hmm. that 10 years now, it, it's going to carry on for much, much longer. Yeah, trust is such an important aspect too, because it's people who experience, uh, you know, traumatic experiences over time you know they're so used to people in and out of their lives and so having someone who's accountable and will always be there and as a reliable resource you can definitely uh, build trust through that pathway so that's a good key value yeah um so i'll go to our next part of our podcast this is the uh, biggest part where we're going to talk about the topic um so talking about empowering uh asian american pacific islander communities um that's something that you've really done um, JP, I'm going to honestly say you've done it as well a lot. Um, as of recent, you're a young guy, but you're growing into that role. And you've been doing it for so long. You have that talent, that skill, that knowledge. Um, so when COVID happened, everything was kind of so confusing. We didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know how we were going to kind of attack this situation. Um, and then the vaccine came out and not everyone could get it. I did not think I would get it, but I really am thankful that I got it. Um, so why did you feel, as a leader of this community, um, why was it so important to make sure that people got the vaccine and um, how was kind of the process of making sure that people got it in an effective way and time? The time, I mean, you were just, it was so smooth how it went. Yeah. So if you can touch on that. And sure. Tell us. You know, we feel that it's really important because this pandemic, if we don't control this pandemic, it's going to control our lives and people that we know is going to die left and right as we saw it. Uh, we feel that it's very important to educate our community so they know what COVID-19 does. And that way, if there's an opportunity for vaccination, that they even get it. So there's a chance if they get it, there's a chance they live longer or they might not get sick and die. Uh, we feel, I strongly feel that it's really important for all of us to do our part in flattening the curve. Because we need to flatten the curve so that we can go back to our normal lives. If we don't, uh, you know, it's uh, if somebody if, some, if people do their part and some doesn't, usually majority will end up with the consequences. Mm -hmm. and it, it's just hard. And when it comes out, we weren't sure what to do. Uh, our agency was closed for a month, meaning that we work from home. Mm -hmm. But I strongly feel that hey, uh, you know, we need to go out there, get out in our community. So we we went, we went back and tried in April. We tried three days a week, and I said, you know, it's doable. Let's do it uh, five days a week. Mm -hmm. and, and two months after that, we, we did five days a week. And wow. ever since then, so I strongly feel that if you're going to serve the community, especially the low income family, you have to be a role model. You have to show up. You have to be there at the front, front line to help out. And it's been hard because uh, September, I, I contracted COVID 19. Mm -hmm. 
it was hard. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, the most scariest thing is that when you go to bed, you don't know if tomorrow you're gonna wake up yeah. because you hear stories that people don't wake up. Mm -hmm. And you pray to God, oh God, I still have kids. I still want to spend time with my kids. Yeah. Uh, what if I don't wake up tomorrow? Yeah. And I understand that people have that fear. So that's why we created a video to educate people about COVID-19. Put a mask on, wash your hand, uh, keep safe, and just social distancing, and things like that. And then when the vaccine became available, we did another video to promote that. Because some people, uh, well, there's a lot of um, untruth stuff that are circulating, or there's a lot of myths circulating mm -hmm. in the media, or um, in other cases, leaders saying, things that are not, they're not supposed to say or whatever. Mm -hmm. But as a result, uh, many people are scared of yeah. the vaccine, so we try to educate people. So we got to the vaccination and said that right now we're facing with another problem is that there are those problem, people who do not want to take it. Yeah, they, awesome. They're scared because of Johnson and Johnson uh, incident where mm -hmm. one uh, died. And there's also an incident with Moderna too. Uh, people are scared, so we need to educate the you know the chance of getting uh, the chance of vaccination, the chance of death is lower in not getting vaccination. Now. Yeah, that's awesome that you're doing uh, the video. I mean, definitely, guys, check that out as well, because um, it is important to understand what what the effects are and why you need it. JP, you were quick. I remember when the vaccine came out, you texted our whole staff and said, "Hey, guys, I want you to get it." Um, can you can you elaborate why you felt it was so important? Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think I think it was a resource right away because uh, you know half of the Multi American Friendship Association did have that available for us, mm -hmm. and knowing that we do work with youth so much yep. and we're exposing ourselves to youth when we're going to the schools, there's a possibility that we could contract it, or if we had it, we could contract it to them. So I thought it was important for us to uh, you know get the vaccine as soon as possible. And in order for us to be able to get back in safely and to work with the kids. So the number one thing was go back to serve. But uh, I, also for us, too, because, you know, we're a small knit group. Mm -hmm. We're like a family. So, you know, we got to take care of each other. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? So uh, that's why I you know I reached out to us. It was a resource that was available quickly. Yep. Let everybody know. And we had to get it done. So I think that same week, everyone went. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think every, so, yeah. everyone went that week. Fully yeah. So, our, yeah. yeah. Our status for yeah. vaccinated, so. so really happy for that resource. So. Yeah, big time. So, can you, when we talk about COVID, can you talk about some? Uh, what are some traumatic experiences some like the monk community go goes through on the daily, and especially our youth? And like, how are you? What are you doing? What are you guys doing to help empower or change, elevate the, their traumatic experiences? Sure, you know, COVID plays such a ugly part in creating trauma in youth and family because of death. Uh, members of the family died, they didn't know how to cope with it, and you see a lot of youth that say, well, God, I guess all my dad, my mom and dad passed away, and how do I deal with this kind of thing? It's difficult. In a monk culture, we have a long funeral, but because of COVID-19, only a couple of hours uh, to, to pay respect. So we do have a lot of youth, a lot of family that express uh, a pain and suffering and says, I can't really say goodbye to my loved one. Uh, I think it's really hard for the youth, uh, especially when they think that living in America is invincible. Because if you live in a third world, every day, you don't know where you're going to die. Yeah, yeah. And people can just go on the street and, and shoot you in the head and things like that. But in America, yeah, we never, we, we have such a luxury life, we have such a, a freedom that we take it for granted, yeah, right? We yeah, do. we take it for granted. And it's just really sad. Also, for the people that we love, they're gone. So mm -hmm. like, it's gone. So those are those those does. And I think uh, we we also uh, have a mental health uh, programs at the Mount American Friendship too. And we are seeing that uh, a lot of uh, people are facing uh, this after effect. And I'm sure that maybe five or ten years from now, I think that we will creep up on them. And uh, we're trying to educate our community too, what are the resources out there to help get in counseling. Because in the monk culture, counseling is not something that we're used to. Yeah. Like, telling our feelings is not something we're used to. Going to those counseling sessions is not something we're used to. So we're trying to educate people and say, you know, it's okay to talk to people. Sometimes you need to talk, talk about it so that we, we have uh, ears to kind of be healed. Yeah. yeah, and uh, 
they, I don't, remember, I don't know if you remember that video. Uh, they did, Hoffa did a collaboration with Nyjo Milwaukee TV and they made a short film called Save Me, which is about mental health mm-hmm. and about like the Hmong culture and how uh, it was adaptable to like going to see, seek help from like American medicine. So if you guys haven't seen that, I advise you guys to go check that video out as well. But I think that, uh, like, like my dad said, Mental health is such a growing aspect that, like, you know, eventually 10 years from now, we will be doing more research on this. Mm-hmm. But I'm glad that Strive 365 has already taken a foothold in it yep. with our curriculum and programming to kind of help the youth. And eventually when they become adults, you know, there's uh, they have better problem solving skills. They're able to deal with traumatic experiences better than uh, overreacting to those situations. What, what are some of the uh, traumatic um, experiences you've noticed uh, growing up as well? Um, in the Hmong community as well. Yeah, for me, I think uh, language barriers, you know, um, I've been fortunate enough that, you know, my parents, they speak good English, but uh, I, I see that my friends and their other, and my, you know, my other buddies in high school, every time they're, they're afraid to have their parents engage with their teachers. They're afraid to have their parents engage with them in sports and stuff like that because of like, they're, they're embarrassed that their parents don't speak English or they don't know the boundaries. So like, I think when you're young, there's a lot of uh, barriers uh, for entry for students to you know, get into like academics that they want to do, uh, participate in sports, and also just like be more involved in the school environment. And so the, it's just the language barrier. Uh, I think just poverty, low income as well, because I think a lot of families during our time, a lot of students, now, people now are second or third generation only. And so now we are finally kind of elevating where you know the population is bigger uh more educated and i think we're kind of overcoming that hump but mm-hmm. i have seen that as an obstacle as a traumatic experience for us and i can tell one of john paul's obstacles when he was little well we took him to a private school okay in a private school there was a i think it was only a minority he was the only minority and he has to go to what they call esl yeah and he has to that and i noticed that his confidence level just went down because yeah. he had to be treated special in yeah. class and one, one year he even got to be sent to a summer school. Yeah. And I just saw him and he's like, I took him to school. I just saw him and he's, he's bothering me as a dad. And I want to go, I said, okay, get in the car, but not going. Yeah. You know? And then it's funny because uh, after that, I uh, removed him from, from that school and uh, brought him to um, a school where there's more minority. Mm-hmm. Well, he's, he, he got a 4.0 screen. Yeah, yeah. And then he played basketball. Pretty yeah. popular. Games Great shooter. Game. Yeah. Great shot. So I'm kind of thinking that, you know, sometimes uh, it, it it helps to be aware of mm-hmm. your surroundings yeah. and where you're accepted at. When kids are more accepted in a certain uh, area or certain atmosphere or some, with a certain uh, surrounding, they tend to be so much better. And yeah. I think I'm, I'm really glad that we made that switch because yeah. I think if we haven't, I'm not sure where Kapo would be today. Yeah. But that's great that you were the person to notice, you know, a lot of parents who say, oh, you'll get through it, you'll get through it. but. It's, it's great to see each person as an individual. Um, he might be different than I am. I'm different than you are. You're different than, but, but everyone adjusts differently. So it's great that you saw that and you said, you know what, he's not fitting here. Let me try here and see how he fits here. Um, and then John Paul, when you actually uh, went to uh, Rufus King, you actually uh, achieved one of your most, I mean, I'd say it's one of your- man, I tell things. this story all the time. Yeah. I think- But it's really yeah, cool, man. Yeah, he remembers, but- you know, playing tennis as a freshman, coming up and went to state as a se- as a senior and got a scholarship as well yeah. to go to school. So that was an awesome experience. But I think the transition from middle school and then going to Rufus King, I think a uh, shout out to Milwaukee Public Schools. Mm-hmm. I think it's a great platform and it really elevated me to where I'm at because yeah. of the diversity that uh, I was exposed to. So. Yeah. And then another thing I see in the Hmong community as beautiful is unity. Um, People like you are making sure that everyone is connected. Everyone is making sure that, hey, you do have a resource, you do have help, um, and, and people will be there to help you out no matter what. Um, so that's great. Um, in today's day, unfortunately, uh, especially in this past um, year, a little bit more, since COVID has come out, there's been a lot of hate uh, towards Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders specifically. Um, a situation as uh, the Atlanta shooting, um, Washington Park, and then um, JP's favorite basketball player, Jamie Lynn, unfortunately, uh, was called coronavirus um, during a basketball game. Just completely unnecessary. One of the greatest individuals as a person, Jamie Lynn. I mean, how can you hate the guy? 
Um, and he didn't even actually uh, name the person who named him. Right. That's how he doesn't want to create any hate. Um, just a lot of, a lot going on and it's just unnecessary, unfortunately. Um, what, ha what do you feel as a community, how we can come together and how do you empower, um, uh, everyone in, in the Hmong, not just the Hmong community, but the Asian American and the Pacific Islander community, how can we come together and work together to say, Hey, you know what? Let, let's solve this problem. Let's make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, how do you as a leader and a human being uh, say, how do we do this? Sure. You know, I really hate to talk about racism, mm -hmm. racism, stereotype, because mm -hmm. some of my, my best friends are white, mm -hmm. African-American, Native American, mm -hmm. Hispanic. When you talk about racism, you almost have to point your finger to certain people to blame and things like mm -hmm. that. But I think that at a time like this, that we need to talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the more we talk about it, the more understanding we are. Kids are really uh, smart. They can mm -hmm. learn from directly or indirectly. Us as adults, when we treat all the people wrongly, the kids pick, pick the knuckles off. And us as leaders, we have to be responsible, accountable for what we said. Because if we said something that's negative, people is going to follow us. Mm -hmm. you know? And unfortunately, uh, we have a lot of leaders in the past that said really negative stuff. That transpired with this hatred of Asian American. Uh, but being Asian American, I think we have to learn how to how to fight back at the same time forgive and forget mm -hmm. too. Because for us to be together as a family, we need to forgive. And it, it's it's easier said than done because the shooting in Atlanta, I have to say that really skewed my language, pisses me off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, for a person to kill so many lives, to yeah. save life for his own craving, mm -hmm. that's unjustified. Right? Completely. And you know, and also uh, this elderly Asian folks that got beat up. Yeah, yeah. And that is, uh, that to me is very sickening. Yeah. Um, I think we have to look inside our heart and say, why, why did we do some of these mm -hmm. things? Uh, and we have to change because if we don't change, our kids are gonna pick up. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be more hate. In, in America. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I wish that people who hate or do the hating, I wish they would live in a third world country. Yeah. Yeah. And so they have a contrast between a third world and how good America is. Yeah. So they don't take anything for granted. Because sometimes when we have too much freedom, we tend to take a lot of things for granted and do what we really want. Just to have that experience, I think it's worthwhile. In my life, I grew up in Laos, I have that experience where I work. You know, the whole day just to get a cup of Coca Cola, half cup, mm -hmm. to drink that for a whole day of labor in yeah. Bobby and I tell you can't. Yeah. And now in America here, you can drink all, 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 whatever you want. That contrast, if you can live and have that contrast, then you can know the difference between love and hate. And I hope that people understand that America is such a loving country that we, we need to understand that and love each other. We just cannot go off and start hitting people because you think you're stronger than other people. Yeah. Um, sometimes I kind of wish those people who abuse other people get abused too, so they know. <laughs> at the same time, treat others the way you. Yeah, the same, yeah. At the same time, I'm hoping that it doesn't have to come to that. Yeah. That they can realize the golden rule. Yeah. Treat other people like you want them to treat you. Yep. Uh, so I think you know, steady being being an example being role models for the, the youth and, you know, continue to kind of build on that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, different perspectives and people, you know, some people feel privileged to speak their minds and haven't experienced the hardships in life too as well. So those are good points that you hit. So we kind of transition real quick. You know, it's really cool. When I look over to my left side and my right, mm -hmm. I see what you're going to become. <laughs> um, it's really cool, by the way, because a lot of like a point that you said is what you teach your kids, they become, and what you've taught him. I, I just it's rotating through. Hopefully, I grab it a little bit on the way and become a good person too. All right. <laughs> but well, he he is a great person. You've raised a great person, and uh, it's great to see leaders uh, making new young leaders who will hopefully continue to keep giving the same message. I think you hit that on the point too, because uh, back in the day. My dad, he used to go to do protests and I and I was a little kid. I did not know anything about a protest, but I went and it was so powerful, but I didn't understand the value of it until recently, you know, with all of these Asian hate crimes, and all that stuff, I attended a protest and felt the energy from it and it was really empowering. 
So uh, I think as a kid, you see that you're getting exposed to those things. And then over time, you understand, you yeah. understand to you value it more. Yeah. Same thing with the Mother New Year. I used to hate going to the New Year's when I was a little kid. But now I love it because it's all about your culture. Yeah. And, you know, you're embracing everybody. Everybody's a community. And like the part you said, unity. So yeah. good point to pose that. Uh, so we're going to uh, our section of called Cope It Out. So when have you experienced like a stressful situation? And when have when and like when have you used like our cope model, which is communication, offering, positivity, or empowerment? So if you could just name like a stressful situation you dealt with in the past, and how do you use those skills to kind of overcome that, overcome that stress? You know, again, the word trust comes into mind. Uh, um, one day I went to work, and this is a gentleman about forty years old, busted into my office with a gun. And he's pacing back and forth like a pit bull. Then he said, I'm gonna kill myself. And then he's got a gun here and I was playing my shoot me. I close my off, I close my door, I said, what's going on? He says, you know what? My wife said I beat her up. Then I'm going to court, I had to pay child support, I lost my job, I lost my house. I have nothing to live for. I spent three hours talking to him and shared with him my own experience. And after a while, we come to a point of understanding. Uh, he gave me the gun, which is a big relief. I put the gun away and said, when is the court date because it's tomorrow? I said, you know what, I'm going to teach you how to talk to a judge. When you talk to a judge, you got to be calm. You have to understand that in a, in a divorce situation, when your wife has the kids and things like that, the chances that you're going to give, if you say a dollar, you're not going to get 50 cents. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to get 30 cents. Yeah. Or, or 25 cents, she's mm -hmm. gonna get 40 or 65 because uh, that's how it is. You have to accept that. Mm -hmm. And at first, he wanna, he could not accept that. Yeah. But after talking to him, he realized that's how it, it, it worked. As so when you talk to a judge, don't don't use strong body language or don't say negative stuff. Uh, let's talk talk to the judge nicely. Let me go talk to me right now. Uh, you know. And after that, he was he was crying. Mm -hmm. uh, after that. He went home. Tomorrow morning, he bought something his suit. He didn't know how to tie a tie, so he came into my office and says, I'm going to court and I don't know how to tie a tie. Yeah. So he came in, I tied a tie for him. So he went to court. But he called me the next day, he called me after the place and said, wow, I think you're as bad as I thought. And I was really happy. That's awesome. And then after so, a month later, when he moved to uh, California, uh -huh. he bought me this flower vase. It's well, to me, it's beautiful, but uh, it looks regular. But yeah. to me, it's precious. He bought it to me. He says, I don't know what to give you. I don't have much money, but this is all I could afford. I want to give you this. Yeah. And I, I have that right on my desk. When people look at there, one, 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 whenever I face a difficult situation, I look at the flower and say, you know what? This guy went through it. I can go through it. And I help all the friends to go through it. And whenever I have... A person who's going to kill themselves and say, look at you know what this is? I would tell the story over and over again you know, to, to help people. Because I think that's how we learn. Yeah. If, we, if, we, if we go through a traumatic situation and we learn from that, we can help all the people understand that. Yeah. I'm a survivor and so do Kirby too. Uh, you know, I was glad that he came to help me. Otherwise, I think you know, he would have killed his wife, kids, or himself. Mm -hmm. Or... For the worst, he would have killed me too, you know. But I'm glad that he, he came to talk and talk about it. He was calm after that. Uh, he took trust. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I was really, really happy with the outcome that I was able to help him out. But at the same time, his story, his story helped so many people after that. Mm -hmm. Because I would use the story to tell all the people in the same situation. It helps a lot of people. I have to yeah. say that it helps more than 50 people because. I would get people that come into my office and they're just like a dying point. It's like, mm -hmm. there's no point in living if I'm gonna lose all these stuff that were so hard for it. Uh, so uh, I'm really glad that he, he, that, that the incident happened for that reason. And that's beautiful that he came to you, uh, someone who could help him. Uh, so, and uh, when you said all those, I thought of all the cope. Yeah, I think uh, it's like you ran through all of them without yeah. even knowing that you actually were running through it. But that's beautiful, I mean, while I was listening to it, man, I just, I could feel how impactful that is. And that's great that, uh, so he showed you appreciation and showed you, hey, thank you. Like, I, I can do it. So that's beautiful. 
And so that's a great example of Kobe. And so just to conclude, um, thank you so much for answering our questions. But to conclude, you get a you, you get an opportunity to shout out. It's called shout it out. So you got 30 seconds to promote anything that you would like. And I was no, I'm gonna give your dad 30 seconds. <laughs> All right, 45 seconds yeah. as a bonus. Bonus, yep, there you go. Do 45 seconds. <laughs> I'm gonna start the clock. Well, should I look at the camera? Yep, you can look at the camera. Okay. This one, that one, anyone, and uh, let's get going. Hey guys, uh, Strive 360 is awesome. Funders out there, please do support Strive 365. They are the future and they will help a lot of you. Youth, kids, all future. We have to invest money, time, and good, be a good role, role model for them. So that's my show out. Wow, 20 oh, yeah. seconds, 20 yeah. seconds. Yeah. Here I'm, we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna do one random question. I always sure. do one random. Okay, oh, I do one shout out too. You do one shout uh, out. Too. Also, stay tuned. The Hung American Friendship Association. We will be having you know the Hung New Year this year, December second, hopefully. December eleventh and twelfth. December eleventh and twelfth, hopefully this year. So come by, support. It's not just for Hmong community members. It's for everyone. So like everybody, come through. Hopefully, it's, is it at the state fair? Stay fair, stay, yeah. at stay fair park at the expo center so go check it out all right random question okay um i do it for all of us okay so i'll start with you or i'll give you some time to think about it okay um growing up what was um what was the most proud jp has ever made you uh well when he cooked me my first dinner okay it was eggs uh, he cooked it and he says, Dad, uh, let's eat dinner. <laughs> I think that's when I know that, oh, okay, I have a good son. I have a son who cares about me, yeah. and I have a son who's very thoughtful. Well, I'm going to have to ask you. Uh, can answer. you give me your phone? I'll call your dad, too. Yeah, my dad, yeah, we're going to have to call him. <laughs> we won't have any, though, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. um, JP, what is the most proud your dad has uh, Let's see. Proudest moment? I think every, every year when he, he hosts the Hmong New Year, he's always the uh the focal point of mm-hmm. giving the speech for the grand finale and there's like a whole bunch of people there mm-hmm. and you know everyone knows that that's my dad so i think just him being the focal point of such an important event i think uh you know it makes me proud of that so that's what i'm looking forward to this year as well i remember the first time i saw you you were holding this massive pikachu do you remember the pikachu oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said that's my dad i said i said yeah. massive massive pikachu yeah Hey, it also is a conversation though. So what was your proudest moment of your dad? Of my dad? Yeah. Um, man, that's a tough one because there's so <laughs> many. Um, I would say um, just raising four amazing kids, um, helping us. Well, I don't know if I include myself. Uh, so three and a half, I'll, I'll count myself. <laughs> that. I'd say just uh, his dedication towards making sure that we were able to um, get an education, make sure that we got food, um, and just making sure that he found a way to be successful in every phase of his life uh, to make sure that it was for us. Um, and then just seeing how he's always been a family person. Um, so I can always look at him and say, thank you for providing that. So definitely. Cool. Um, so guys, um, we really appreciate you guys listening. Uh, we really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Um, really amazing to see uh, a leader like you come on this uh, podcast and give us so much insight and so much growth. Um, so you guys definitely learn learn as much as you can from this man and this man right here um get involved in the monk community learn from the monk community because it's so enriching it um i've learned a lot in my three years of knowing jp um so definitely try to learn more about a different community don't think that oh I, i'm in this community i don't need to learn about this one or this one when we all come together and we all really work together you learn so much difference and you learn ways that you never thought you could learn um, so come together, uh, become a leader in any possible way you can, give back to your community and those around you, and watch the difference that you get. And be selfless. I see selflessness right here in front of me. Um, so challenge is up to you, and you'll look back 10, 20 years, and you'll say, what did I do that, I, that really impacted the world? So strive, strive 365, six, coming, coming to you all the way, way live. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for tuning in to the PeteCast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and all of our social media outlets for the latest content. See you guys soon.